Okay. Uh, so I'm Darren War from Johns Hopkins University, and I'm, I guess, kind of going to give an introduction for the other two speakers we're going to follow. Um, this is a, I'm basically going to review an essay that I wrote with Adam Sobol and Lorenzo Polvani from Columbia that appeared in the BAMS issue a couple of years ago. And this came about because I guess in 2014, uh, Polar Vortex all of a sudden became uh, everyday vocabulary, was in the media coverage, and there seemed to be a lot of confusion about. And um, we set about trying to kind of understand exactly what a polar vortex is and what people were kind of meaning. And so I've done a lot of work in primarily stratospheric polar vortices. So I thought the coverage was good. Um, unfortunately, it was the coverage was good, but it was very kind of confusing. Um, and so this mean that I didn't make, someone else made this on the web, kind of summarized our feeling around that time. So, you know, I'm just trying to describe what I think a polar vortex is and, and some of the kind of features and how they might relate to uh, surface weather. Darren, just um, to stop you for a second, we yep. actually don't see the, f we still see the slides on the side. Um, ah. uh, I think, and now we see the the like presenter view where we can see your notes. But I think um, if you click, um, hey, okay, I was sorry about that. Yeah, how about that? Yep, thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so what is a polar vortex um, in atmospheric science? My reading of the literature is that it's historically started out as an abbreviation for any circumpolar flow. So a large scale, planetary scale, west to east flow that goes around the globe. And this started in the literature in around the late 40s, early 1950s, looking at winds or geopotential height. Nowadays, we most people looking at the dynamics looks at potential vorticity. And the, the vortex is a region with high potential vorticity or PV and the strong winds occur at the edge of the vortex when there's large gradients. Um, and the, I think the main confusion that was out there was the fact that there is in each hemisphere, there's two distinct polar vortices. Well, in fact, there's, um, there's also tropopause polar vortices, which are smaller scale. So there's, there's three, but most of the literature is focused on, um, the stratospheric vortex and the tropospheric vortex. And certainly in the media, but also I think in the literature, quite often they get confused together or not describe what you're talking about. So the, the stratospheric vortex is in the stratosphere. It's, it's a schematic shows is typically smaller and less disturbed. Whereas the tropospheric vortex is a kind of broader scale. Um, and I think the easiest way to see that is to look at the zonal mean zonal winds. So the plot on the left is the January climatology. On the right is July. And the, the red colors are the westerly winds, blue uh, easterlies. And there's these little, um, the diamonds, if you shoot them, they're showing the, the peak winds at each level. So in the stratosphere, so above 100 hectopascal, there's strong wind in the winter hemisphere, July in the southern hemisphere, January in the northern hemisphere. And then in the troposphere, there are westerly winds all year round, and they're clearly kind of separated. There's a break at around 100. So we have a tropospheric polar vortex and a stratospheric polar vortex. Now, People looking at this, most people think, well, hang on, that's just the, the jet stream or the subtropical jet. And in, in effect, that's what the tropospheric polar vortex is. Is the it's, So it's not in the polar regions, but it's, it's more just the jet stream. Um, and just to highlight some of these differences, so this is the stratospheric vortex. 
the top plot showing the winds at 100 hectopascals, strong winds in the winter in the southern hemisphere and in the northern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere winds are uh, stronger. The vortex is more kind of circular. The northern vortex gets is weaker, more distorted. It has these southern stratospheric warming events, which maybe Judah will touch on, um, and other things that are closely related to um, surface weather events. The fact that the Antarctic stratospheric vortex is stronger and colder is why there's an Antarctic ozone hole and not an Arctic ozone hole. So anyhow, so this is the stratospheric view. This is the the tropospheric polar vortex, or if you like, the jet stream or subtropical jets, mid-latitude jets. And so there's exists all year round, but it is still stronger in the northern hemisphere. And the bottom plot is showing, you know, the size. So the, the black contour is an indication of where someone might put the edge of the tropospheric vortex, and the white is the stratospheric vortex. Um, and so this is when you start to see the, the possible connection with uh, weather events. So one confusion was that there's a tropospheric vortex and a stratospheric vortex. The second confusion is that they both play a role in, or can play a role in weather events, or extreme surface weather events, but the mechanism is kind of different. Um, so the stratospheric vortex link is, I think is a more kind of indirect link, more statistical that there's increased probability of say cold out air outbreaks following periods of a disrupted vortex. And again, I think Judah will touch on some of those connections. The tropospheric vortex is much more um, direct. And in effect, these extreme weather events can be viewed as just a distortion or disturbances propagating around the edge of the tropo tropospheric vortex. And so the event in 2014 is the, the cold air outbreak over the eastern US was just a um, disturbance to the edge of the kind of vortex. And you can just equivalently say that it's a large scale wave propagating on the jet stream and troughs and, and ridges. Um, so I guess that was the point I wanted to get across is that there are these two different polar vortices. They both play a role in weather events, but their mechanisms are kind of different. And so getting it set clear which vortex you're talking about and whether it's a direct linkage or whether it's statistical, I think is going to be important to kind of make progress. Um, and I should just say that it's not clear to me that talking in terms of a tropospheric polar vortex adds anything to the traditional way of talking about it in terms of a jet stream or troughs or ridges. Um, but unfortunately, the, the term polar vortex is out there. And so um, rather than saying we shouldn't use it, we've just got to make clear um, which one we're using. Um, okay, that was all I had. Thanks. That was perfect. So we were, uh, I think some people saw because my chats were going to everyone. We were just talking about the time. Um, so maybe we have time for one question uh, for Darren before we move on. And if no questions, then um, we can have Judah start and we'll, we'll save time at the end for a larger group discussion. Thanks, Darren. Okay, everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Yes, looks good. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about you know, taking on, you know, continuing on from Darren's talk, um, and, you know, talk about the, the increasing Arctic influence on mid-latitude weather, including extreme weather, and, and um, I guess won't be surprised that my answer is, that link is, is through the polar vortex. So I think it's certainly a very timely Topic: We had a lot of news coverage about the polar vortex, especially um, in the U.S. I think everybody on the call is from the U.S. Um, and you know, so 2014, you know, might have been uh, the coming out party for the polar vortex in the media, but certainly, um, 
you know, this year certainly as well got a lot of a lot of um, coverage in the media. So if we look at the the temperature trends, as winter temperature trends on the top plot. Look at say 1960. It looks like what we would expect, anticipate from global warming, general warming everywhere, and then it's amplified in the Arctic. And if we look at the time series uh, of Arctic and and then outside the Arctic temperature uh, time series, uh, they're comparable. At least let's talk about trends through uh, much of since 1960. But then about 1990. You can see that the Arctic, which is shown in red, uh, diverges, or you know, the, the warming is accelerating relative to the rest of the, the northern hemisphere. And if you take a, in this period, let's say since 1990, we call it Arctic amplification. You take a trend instead over that same period, uh, just the Arctic amplification period, you get this uh, surprising pat temperature pattern across the hemisphere. So you get, um, so you suddenly see this amplified warming in the Arctic. Now it's much more amplified, but now you get this cooling in, across the mid latitudes. And it's certainly been a, a topic of debate, but you know, are the two linked? Uh, certainly myself and others, but you know, I've tried to make the argument that, that they are. It's not, a, it's not a coincidence, it's not random, but the two, two are linked. And for me, the answer is uh, that linkage goes through the polar vortex. So I'll just show this animation. On the left one that's is going right now, that's a, a strong polar vortex. Again, this is in the stratosphere, it's not the tropospheric polar vortex. And the blue shading represents cold temperatures, the, the yellows and the oranges are warmer temperatures. And you can see that when the, in the normal state of the polar vortex or a strong state, the cold is confined to the Arctic region and you have milder on the periphery or in, uh, you know, in the lower latitudes, mid and latitudes and say subtropics. And that is, um, is, a, you know, is, a, is very different when you have a, a weak polar vortex. So it starts out uh, strong like in this year, which is 2010. Uh, so again, the cold air is confined to the Arctic, but then you can see this warm air is rushing into the Arctic, the oranges, and that cold air then gets uh, displaced to lower latitudes because the blue is now sh showing up across the mid latitudes. Uh, also, the, you know, the, when you had one coherent polar vortex, uh, and this is from 1988, 89, here it splits into uh, well, you know, at least two pieces. So we have a polar vortex split, which is what we've seen the past uh, two winters, you know, so last winter and, and this most recent winter as well. Um, and so what, <clears throat> why is Arctic change, Arctic implication, in, you know, influencing or, you know, influencing, let's say my argument would be um, influencing mid-latitude weather and, and I've you know, kind of borrowed our banner here an anthem from, from real estate, right? Location, location, location that um, a lot of the warming is focused in this barents Kara Sea region of the Arctic. And actually, um, you get, there's been an increase in Siberian snow cover, but uh, that's, you know, that's a whole other uh, talk, but that's leading to colder temperatures across Siberia. So you have, um, across Northwest Eurasia, you have warming, heating uh, from, the la the, from the disappearing sea ice. And then in the Northeast Asia, you know, primarily Siberia, you have this cooling uh, due to increase in, in snow cover. And if you look at the, the natural planetary waves uh, you know, across the Northern Hemisphere, you have this general trough across Northeast Asia and um, this, this ridge across Northwest Eurasia. Uh, so this is, this is the, um, you know, the, the full values here on the left and here are the anomalies. You can see the, you know, the negative dashing these are a low geopotential heights, so it's, let's say mid-troposphere, so troughing. And um, over here, across northwest Europe, across, let's say near Scandinavia, that area, you have this uh, naturally occurring, the standing wave uh, is for ridging. So you have these positive, you know, these solid representing positive contours. I'm kind of just um, putting that together. Um, so in the, in the fall, you have the, the lack of sea ice is actually on the Pacific side. Uh, let's say the, the Beaufort uh, Sea, uh, maybe Chukchi Sea. Um, and that, you know, again, it's, it's a lot of this is, um, you know, is, is still up for debate, but the, the open water maybe can cause a lake effect. So there's been this increasing snow cover in the fall time across Siberia. Uh, then as you get into the late fall and into early winter, the, the area of greatest sea ice loss is not on the Pacific side, but on the North Atlantic side, focused in the Barents-Kara Sea. So you have this heating across that Northwest Eurasia, 
heating uh, gives you a, a ridging in the mid troposphere, and then you have this increased snow cover, uh, which gives you cooling. So that gives you kind of the, this cooling gives you troughing. So this is the kind of an anomalous space, right? You're getting this heating to the to the west and cooling to the east. That projects constructively onto the stand, naturally occurring standing wave, and that increases the the the, you know, the wave activity flux, the ice and pond flux from the troposphere that you know that um, escapes, let's say, from these from these Rossby waves, these large planetary waves in, in the troposphere and into the area where the into the where the polar the stratospheric polar vortex is. And then you go from this, when you have this increase in this uh, wave activity flux or this uh, polar heat transport, that disrupts the polar vortex. It could stretch and it could split in, in, into multiple pieces. And um, also most important, I didn't point out in the animation, but you could, I mean, what's very important is with these polar vortex disruptions, you get this heating in the Arctic. So, um, and then the cooling in the mid latitudes. If you look at, um, you know, we did a cluster analysis on the different polar vortex states. We found, you know, basically seven major clusters and going from the top left to the bottom right, they go from stronger to weaker, where kind of the strong clusters are on the top and the weaker on the right. But you can see this general decreasing trend, especially the strongest cluster, there's been this decrease, decreasing trend over the reanalysis period or the satellite period. And there's been an increasing trend in the weaker polar vortex state. And, and the weakest one here is all the way on includes cluster seven. Again, um, we found a statistically significant, um, you know, increasing trend. And again, uh, as Darren was saying, Paul, the truth is that a lot of this is statistically shown and not uh, so much, uh, you know, the, the, the dynamical reasons are still, uh, for, uh, you know, we, we don't fully understand. But if you look at, at the temperature, you know, um, anomalies, when you have a strong vortex versus a, a weak vortex, so the strong vortex is on the, uh, on, on the left, and you can see you have a cold Arctic and then warm across the mid latitudes, eastern United States and northern Eurasia. Um, but when the vortex is weak, you tend to have, uh, and this is like the week of, 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 a, of a weak vortex, you have a, a warm Arctic and then uh, cold mid latitudes, but it's, it is focused across northern Eurasia. That's where the strongest signal is. Though, if you look out, but, so this is week one, two, and three following. Um, a, a weak vortex, you can see that those cold temperatures migrate from the Eurasia over to east, uh, over to North America, Central and Eastern uh, North America, especially the Eastern US. So it's, even though initially it seems to be, you know, mostly focused across Eurasia, it does include the Eastern US. And not just talking about cold, cold air outbreaks, but here's uh, again, the uh, snowstorms, but I guess very suggestive tr uh, plot. This is looking at uh, the largest Northeast so those are put out by NOAA, it's called Nessus. They rate them like Hurricane Sapphire Simpson scale one to five. But if you look at these um, disruptive Northeast snowstorms, there's been as, mu as many as eight in previous decades. They started counting in 1958. And, and the most recent decade, it's 27. So the most recent decade, um, we've had a tripling of these disruptive um, Northeast snowstorms. And just kind of to wrap it up, I, I've done um, you know, a study looking at more rigorously, the Arctic temperatures. So again, when you have a polar vortex disruption, you amplify, you further, you know, I mean, there's this, uh, from climate change, there is this uh, warming of the Arctic, but when you have a polar vortex disruption, you have a kind of this amplification from uh, dynamical warming as well. I was looking at Arctic temperatures and, and, and different US cities, uh, severe winter weather, and use this index, AWSSI, but it's just kind of an all-inclusive all uh, severe winter weather index. But uh, here in the blue and red graphs are the Arctic temperature. So, and the green is the severe winter weather. And you can see it's very, very linear relationship. When the Arctic is cold, you have a less chance or less probability or low, these lower values of severe winter weather index. This is for Boston. And then as the Arctic gets warmer and warmer, you have an increase in severe winter weather. When the Arctic is at its warmest, you have this uh, very large, much increased probability of severe winter weather in the Boston area. And looking at, here's the polar cap temperatures or polar cap heights uh, trend. So daily and, and the reds and the blues. So in general, the Arctic is getting warmer, um, no argument there. But if, uh, in the stratosphere, it only warms when you're getting these uh, polar vortex disruptions or the sudden stratospheric warming, as Darren called them, uh, from mid to late January. And you can see, so, and that further amplifies the already warm Arctic. 
And the black line shows the trend in severe winter weather, not much of a trend or a decreasing trend in the early part of the winter, but following these polar vortex disruptions, and again, there's been this increasing trend that show, shows up in this plot, which is the red shading here in the stratosphere, so above 100 millibars per hectopascals. There's actually an increasing trend in severe winter weather. Um, this is for Boston, but it's represented for many northeastern uh, uh, U.S. cities. And so that's it. So, uh, you know, just kind of a summary of my talk. World is warming. The Arctic is warming two or three times faster. Um, and, and so we have um, the, the right, we have, it's really focused, the sea ice melt has been focused at Barents Kara Seas. And then you have, so you have warming across that region. You have cooling across Siberia, increasing snow cover. And this, and as I'm trying to argue in my 10 minutes here, uh, you know, this is favorable for disrupting the polar vortex. Um, and so I, I would argue that this, uh, this amplified Arctic warming is resulting in more episodes of polar vortex disruptions. And as again, Dan said, and I kind of show, try to show, I mean, we have a statistical relationship when, um, when you have a polar vortex disruption in severe winter weather, is it, you know, the probability is increased. So, um, you know, maybe we're getting kind of the cumulative effect is uh, maybe a shorter winter season, but often following these polar vortex disruptions, we, we see these more intense mid to late winter, um, you know, winter epi episodes. And you know, we had a very good, I think, I think really nice example of that just this past winter across the Northern US and, and across Canada. Uh, so that's, that's it for me. Thanks, Judah. Uh, does anybody have a question for Judah before we move on? That will go to Stephen, and then we'll open it up for discussion after that. Okay, are people seeing my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, then I'll go ahead. So I will wrap things up by focusing downward on mostly on the troposphere, looking at these Arctic mid-latitude climate linkages. Uh, the big question is how far equatorward Boreas's icy breath extends. Having troubles advancing here. There we go. So as Judah talked about, the Arctic amplification has become commonplace since the 1990s. He talked about winter, it's showing here in all seasons. So it's a relatively recent phenomenon since the 1990s, but no doubt it is happening. And the other thing that's happening is an increase overall in extreme weather in the United States and elsewhere, uh, quantified here by the Climate Extremes Index from NOAA. This is a, an aggregate measure of various types of extreme weather quantified by the area of the country experiencing extreme weather. Going back to 1910, you can see that especially in the last two decades, there's been a pronounced increase with some really dramatic years, record years in 2012, 2015, 2016, and even last year made it into the top 10. So the Arctic is warming rapidly, extreme weather is generally increasing, and so the natural question is, are these two things linked at all? And various hypotheses have been put forth and refuted over the years in this controversial topic. One of the fairly early ones was put forth by Jennifer Francis and me in 2012, where we argued based on thermal wind relationship that the uh, Arctic amplification should weaken the meridional temperature gradient equator to pole. And by virtue of the thermal wind, uh, that should slow the jet stream flow or the tropospheric polar vortex uh, in the future compared to the past. And a weaker flow is often associated with a wavier flow. And when we get weaker wavier flow situations in the jet, it often leads to prolonged periods of extreme weather, such as droughts, heat waves, and floods and the like. So is there evidence to support that hypothesis? Well, there is conditional evidence. So in summertime, it does appear that the circulation has been weakening. In this study led by Dim Kaumau from 2015, looking at the zonal wind speed at 500 hectopascals, about five kilometers up in the atmosphere, looking at a block from 35 to 70 degrees, they found a statistically significant decrease in the westerly wind strength. But interestingly, they only found it during summer and not during winter, despite the larger uh, warming in the Arctic during the winter time. There's also some support for increasing trends in high amplitude circulation patterns, uh, represented here by the number of days in which a, a ridge to trough meridional distance is above a certain threshold. 
this is work that uh, I did with Jennifer Francis in 2015. We looked at different seasons at the top and start different starting points. So 1990 onward, 1995 onward, and 2000 onward, and looked at different regions of the Northern Hemisphere. Areas in red are where there's been an increasing trend, significantly increasing trend in these high amplitude circulation patterns. The darker the red, the bigger the increase. And you can see that depending on the season, uh, well, overall, you can see that there's more red than blue. And so there's general uh, support for the, this um, trend toward a wavier circulation pattern, but it is very seasonally dependent. It's most prevalent during the autumn and uh, also in certain sections during the summer, but at the same time, there are other places like in Asia where there's a change significant of the opposite sign, so a less wavy circulation pattern. So I would say there is conditional support for this idea of a, a weaker wavier circulation associated with Arctic amplification, but there's definitely a, a muddled picture that has emerged. And one reason for that muddled response could be that the very fact that the Arctic is not the only show in town. As we know, in a global warming scenario, other regions of the world warm and contribute to changes in dynamics. One example given here led by Libby Barnes and James Screen showing projected winter warming patterns in CMIP-5 models for the late 21st century. And you see this dumbbell-shaped warming pattern in an atmospheric vertical cross-section with intense surface-based Arctic warming, the lower right, and uh, higher tropospheric warming in the tropics in the upper left. And Depending on which part of the elephant you're feeling, you'll come to different conclusions about what to expect in terms of the mid-latitude jet. If you're focused solely on the Arctic, you would say, well, we're gonna re reduce that uh, north-south temperature gradient, height gradient, that should lead through the thermal wind relationship to a weaker jet in mid-latitudes. But if you're focused more on the tropics, you'd come to the opposite conclusion. You're actually strengthening this temperature gradient and that should lead to a stronger jet. And so depending on your point of view, uh, it's not obvious which region will prevail. And in reality, it probably will depend uh, differently in different latitude bands and in different seasons. Um, and so it takes away some of the um, uh, expected response that was er uh, hypothesized from some of these early ideas. Another complication that's emerged is there appears to be some strong uh, conditional dependence on the atmospheric state, um, state dependence on any sort of Arctic mid-latitude connection. Now, this is taken from a paper led by Jennifer in 2017, showing in schematic terms two different scenarios, one with uh, an Arctic mid-latitude connection very apparent and the other not. So in scenario one, this um, schematic of the jet stream, the tropospheric polar vortex with the ridge here, the trough there, and we have the Arctic uh, amplification signal shown here in the Beaufort Sea. This is a November pattern, less sea ice, strong positive SST anomalies, and that favors uh, a warming of the atmospheric column aloft. But because the trough is, is displaced and troughs represent relatively cool atmospheric columns, there's essentially destructive interference and not much remote response. The idea is in scenario two, that this wave is phase shifted to the east and it just so happens that the ridge, the relatively warm column there is coinciding with the strong surface heating to give this uh, wave a strong kick and uh, with it, the downstream response toward deeper troughing and colder weather in North America. A third complication is that the spatial pattern of Arctic amplification itself is very seasonally dependent. And we can look to the future to get a really strong signal. This is coming from CESM projected future changes in the late 21st century, 500 hectopascal height, so essentially a measure of how inflated the atmosphere is, the warming of the atmosphere column, if you will. The wintertime pattern on the left is showing the most intense warming uh, right here in the central Arctic, aided by the large loss of sea ice, with the blue areas representing much smaller increases in temperature uh, from the Pacific stretching across North America. Whereas in the summertime, it's almost the opposite with the relative minimum in surface heating or column heating in the interior Arctic and the biggest increases in a circumpolar band, uh, largely land-based, uh, in the subpolar regions. And if we look at that same anomaly pattern over North America, 
we see consequences in terms of the flow. So during the, the winter time on, in the left, uh, the 500 hectopascal zonal wind anomalies show a very distinct dipole change with weaker westerlies shown in blue, centered in subpolar latitudes, and stronger winds aloft centered in subtropical latitudes coming into California. Similarly, in the summer, same kind of dipole response in the westerlies with stronger flow in the subpolar regions and even more distinctive decreases in westerly winds over the interior part of North America. And we showed that it was also a wavier flow. And that's important in terms of extreme weather and impacts because climate models for years have been predicting that in a greenhouse warming scenario, there would be drying of interior continents. CESM's version of this is shown here. These are uh, summertime percentage rainfall differences in the future, ranging from decreases of 20 to 50% over the central plains. So this would have big impacts uh, for agriculture, no doubt. And a lot of that is being spurred by that weakened wind flow. And in our analysis from this paper, that I led a couple years ago, we concluded that an important factor could well be a cryospheric contribution from diminishing snow cover. So this is the model response in spring on the left and summer on the right for snow cover fraction. Uh, and you see these big reductions in Canada, especially north of, just north of the Canadian border in spring, further north over Canada and the central Arctic in summer. And our argument was that this reduction in snow cover provides some extra surface heating to reduce the radial temperature gradient across North America and thereby contribute to the large weakening of the winds aloft over the interior, which in turn favors more of a drought pattern. So to wrap up, uh, there is partial observational evidence to support the hypothesized Arctic influence on mid-latitudes, that being a weaker wavier circulation. But other factors, such as the superimposed tropical warming trend, is more likely to cause a, a more complex dipole pattern of circulation changes. And that's something that's come about more in recent years than original uh, expectations. I think summertime linkages between the Arctic and mid-latitudes has been understudied, and it merits further investigation. And associated with that, the impact of shrinking snow cover could be playing an important role, particularly in the summertime response. And so I think that also is a, a low-hanging fruit that uh, should be uh, pursued further. And I will stop there. Thanks, Steve. Does anybody have a question for Steve before we open it up for broader discussion? Steve, this is Phil Rash. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, it was just to ask, um, do you have any hypotheses about what other summertime phenomena that you might see changing uh, that, that have been understudied at this point in the game? Summertime changes in the Arctic itself? Well, I think you were indicating that there was the connections had been understudied between the Arctic and mid-latitudes in the summertime. Wasn't that on your last slide or last slide but one? Right. I just was, and you, and I think you were highlighting, among others, the potential role on the hydrologic cycle, or you know, its impact on droughts. So I, I'm just wondering whether there are other things that you speculated might be manifesting also. Um, well, I guess the the traditional view is that the uh, that this is just a simple expansion of the subtropical highs um, over in this case, North America, but also over Eurasia. Um, and so that would be more of a, you know, the Arctic wouldn't be playing an important role in that case. It would really be coming more from low latitudes, spreading upward, and uh, the snow cover might not be playing a significant role. But I, I think in terms of, the, you know, the basic argument why summertime linkages have been less studied, in my opinion, is because the, the much stronger signal that we see is in winter, as we saw in that projection from CESM. You know, we have 20, 25 degrees C surface warming in January. You know, you wow. figure there's got to be a, an effect. If there's going to be an effect, it's got to be from that. But, um, you know, the, the more modest changes in the summer, I think, uh, could be, you know, haven't been studied as much just because the signal is weaker. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, I want to thank all three of our speakers. Those were excellent presentations. Um, and I really appreciated them. So we'll open it up for some broader discussion between the speakers as well as everybody who's attending the call. Um, and so maybe I'll start with kind of a general question to all three of you. 
and I'm, you know, putting on my program officer hat, what's needed, Steve talked about some understudied things, but what's needed in terms of observational networks or measurements or next steps in modeling um, to confirm some of these hypotheses um, or, and or answer some of the emerging questions, or is the answer just time at this point? Yes. Well, I guess I'll make a plug for your next webinar. The uh, PA MIP next month is Polar Amplification Model Intercomparison Project. One of the frustrations has been these different results that various modeling studies have come to, completely different in some cases, about whether there's any significant connection between uh, Arctic warming and mid-latitude circulation. And it's been argued, and I agree, that part of the problem is that people have used very different methodologies, uh, different experimental design, and, and so we're comparing apples to oranges in many cases. And so when we come to a conclusion that, you know, one study says there is a link, the other study says there's not a link, um, neither of those may be really the clear-cut answer. And so this PA MIP, as we'll learn more next month, is an attempt to try to coordinate these modeling experiments, similar to CMIP, so that people are using the same kind of boundary conditions and if whatever conclusions we draw are more consistent and more robust across models. Yeah, I would just add to what Steve said, and I agree that the PA MIP is an important step, but also, um, I mean, I, I'm struck by, if you look at the vertical extent of the heating in the Arctic, uh, and I'm talking about winter time, between what's been observed so far in this era of Arctic amplification and what's been modeled or simulated, they're, they're quite strikingly different. Uh, the models are much shallower, and the, um, the observations, it's, it's much, a much deeper heating. And, and I don't think we really have an understanding of, of why that difference is. You know, it could be the sensible latent heat fluxes out of, out of the Arctic that are not being properly, properly simulated. I don't know, but I mean, there, I think if we can try to get to that answer, you know, if we had an observational network that better um, can tell us, answer us about, um, the, you know, the energy and, and the turbulent fluxes that are going over, over the Arctic, I think um, that could go a long way to, uh, you know, trying to understand the differences between the models and maybe, you know, um, you know, what, uh, maybe help us understand why the models and the observations disagree because the shallower heating shouldn't, you know, you have less chance of impacting the mid latitude weather where you have a much deeper heating than, you know, it's, it increases in my opinion, the chance of influencing mid latitude weather. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, not you know, I don't, I don't totally design observational systems or um, so you know I don't know what how to get to that but I mean I think that's something that I, I'm really struck by um, and I, I think for like a lot of these tur turbulent heat flux again not my expertise it seems like we're, we're relying on reanalysis products you know to to to, to get you know to to, to to understand the you know the 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 magnitude of these fluxes and the direction of the fluxes and we you know I think we have really no idea how good the reanalysis is and probably is not very good. All right, well, thank you for that perspective. Um, any other comments on that or other questions, discussion topics? Well, I have one, if I can pose one uh, to Darren. Um, I'm curious, you know, I, I got, and I, I know Judah too, got a lot of calls from reporters during this intense cold wave, the so-called polar vortex in late January over the Midwest. And, you know, always the question was how to, you know, what did you do about this term polar vortex? Do you just go along with it because it's sort of colloquial shorthand for a cold wave? Or as a scientist, you try to correct and explain there's two different ones and yada, yada. Um, what's your thinking in terms of a science communication question? What's the, the best way for us to respond to the media on this? I'm not sure that I'm the best person to, to explain how to, to discussing with the kind of media, but I think we're going to, the two terms are the term is out there and so i think the main thing is to try and distinguish the between the fact that there is a stratospheric vortex that can have a role but there's also a, a tropospheric one and i think we just have to try and clarify that and i think it's not only the media i think i read i've read lots of things that are put out 
including some by federal agencies where the description is all muddled. Um, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on how you talk to the general public, but I think if we, the term's out there, and so we now have to just try and better explain what it is. But I'm open for other suggestions from other people because um, it seems we're very muddled still. I yeah, think that's are. a good, good point from, and especially mentioning that even from federal agencies that we, we need to clarify and educate people. And so I'll just add to, I saw somebody mention on Facebook that's, you know, doesn't have a science background at all that say that when they were a kid, this term never existed. <laughs> so um, I think it just didn't exist in, in the mainstream media and public. Um, but I think I cut somebody off there too, so somebody else is trying to speak. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, you know, I was resistant when they first used it in 2014, but I mean, my attitude since then has been, you know, you can't beat them, join them. Um, and I've kind of embraced this term polar vortex. I, you know, like you were um, saying that we didn't hear it we're growing up, but I think our understanding of the polar vortex and its relationship to, to our daily weather, I think is, you know, the, that appreciation has only happened very recently, you know, even among scientists. So, um, I mean, I, I am struck by that. I do think that there's a much stronger relationship than we had really recognized uh, between the polar, you know, let's say the stratospheric polar vortex and the tropospheric polar vortex in our, in our, you know, in our weather. Um, and, and I've certainly tried to argue that there's been a much stronger relationship than, than we, you know, than the community has kind of um, as, as um, admitted or, you know, or as discussed. Can I ask a question? This is Sukyong Nikoli. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is a general question, question to uh, both Judah and uh, Steve. So I just was wondering uh, from your analysis, um, can you actually tell whether um, Arctic warming is causing the waviness or actual waviness is causing Arctic warming? Yeah, that's a, a good point. And I think the jury's still out and, and surely it's both, right? Um, and, and I know some work that you've done and others has really uh, opened my eyes to the, uh, the case that it, you know, the, the coupled response between the two regions. And I, I think for sure, if there's a, a wavier flow for whatever reason in mid latitudes, let's say it's chaotic or driven by the tropics or what have you, um, that that too plays a role in uh, the Arctic amplification itself. And potentially that feeds back on mid latitudes. So um, yeah, I think I've been guilty of, of kind of one way thinking, Arctic driving the mid latitudes, but you know, in a couple system, it's, it goes both ways. And so I think there's become a better appreciation that uh, say wavier flow in mid latitudes can in turn have a, a important bearing on Arctic amplification and temperatures generally in high latitudes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I mean, I don't have much to add. I mean, it's not really my expertise, but um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, uh, I mean, I'm struck by, um, we don't have a really good understanding of the causes of Arctic warming. And, it, you know, it certainly seems like it, it, it certainly makes sense that that warming um, is both a combination of, local warming, you know, let's say sea ice melt, but also from um, remote, remote forcing, you know, from the, let's say tropical convection. Um, so, uh, you know, I, um, I don't know if it's, you know, there's an increasing waviness that's leading to more Arctic warming, but um, it certainly seems like, the, you know, the warming um, is, you know, a combination of different influences. And these moisture intrusion events that have been uh, relatively common the last few years uh, are a good example of uh, strong amounts of energy from the Atlantic region coming into the Arctic, especially during winter, that can have a huge impact uh, in terms of spiking the temperatures, at least for a while, short term in the Arctic. But if in the short term, but I think if that uh, occurs more often or actually stronger, the event becomes stronger, it will appear as a long-term trend, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it's really hard to um, separate the uh, short-term uh, process from the long-term trend. 
And yeah. I just like to add that it's not necessarily related to responding to Arctic warming. Uh, whatever causes Arctic warming can cause Arctic warming and act and cool the middle latitude at the same time if it's a due to wave. So I just like to point that out. And, and I wanted to add, Steve, you probably know, I've looked at this more about Arctic cyclones and the role of transport could be significant because in most of these events, there's a exceptionally strong Arctic cyclone that's also necessary to have that heat exchange. And these are poorly um, represented in climate models, especially um, if, if much at all. And, uh, and going back, I think, to the observational network, that's where upper tropospheric and lower stratospheric observations matter, which we hardly have any of in the Arctic, at least especially for moisture, which is really important. We have very few um, really good observations of moisture that high. Right. So for what you study, that's really a critical need, isn't it? Yeah. So we're getting close to running up against the end of our hour. Um, I don't want to stop anybody from having conversation, though I think people can, can talk uh, more amongst themselves. Does anybody have any last things they want to discuss, um, and then after that we'll close the meeting with any announcements um, if anyone wants to make it. I, I would have one question, just out of general interest, I suppose. Um, I, I know this is an Arctic forum, but are there any um, processes like this going on in the Southern Hemisphere as well? Well, I'm not sure. Um, what you're saying, uh, well, exactly a question. I mean, we don't get these polar vortex disruptions really in the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, um, I think McDowell might jump in there, but uh, he was showing you know, the polar vortex in the Southern Hemisphere is much stronger. We don't have land sea contrast in mid latitudes. We don't, um, we don't have the high topography in the, again, the Southern Hemisphere mid latitudes, which is really, I think, critical for disrupting the polar vortex. As well, we're not, we're not, I mean, I think just starting now to see maybe some kind of Antarctic amplification, but we've also have, really haven't seen this accelerated warming in the high latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere either. I think because, a lot, because of the, um, you know, the ocean circulation there kind of acts like a, a buffer, uh, you know, keeps uh, kind of protects Antarctica of, of war warming from, from uh, lower latitudes. And of course, um, you know, the, the Antarctic is snow covered as much, you know, now as it was pretty much before. I mean, we're not seeing this. I mean, the sea ice, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really going way outside my comfort zone with talking about this, but um, probably also the sea ice loss is quite different. Until recently, there really was an Antarctic sea ice loss, but I mean, the, if we're, the community is assuming that sea ice loss is a large contributor to you know, this Arctic amplification, and we're not, you know, we're not getting the same thing in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's, it's, you know, it's a different, I think it's a very different animal in the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, okay, great, thanks. This is Eric. I'm sitting in at Heidi's desk here in Alaska. Just had one last question. Has anyone looked at um, the impact of ENSO on this phenomena? Or maybe there hasn't been enough uh, data since 2014 yet. But a, a rule of thumb maybe forecasters would like to have is something like, in a strong La Nina winter, look for a certain characteristic of polar vortex activity. Is there anything like that that, that maybe has been stumbled upon? Uh, yeah, I think there are some studies that certainly looked at um, polar vortex and Arctic warming associated with ENSO. So, you know, I have a paper 2012 shows that during La Nina, Arctic is, a, is warmer and El Nino is colder. So during La Nina, Arctic is colder, middle latitude is cold. Uh, I'm sorry, during La Nina, Arctic is warmer and middle latitude is colder and the other way around during El Nino. Yeah, I've done a little bit of work on this. I was just, um, you know, on the polar vortex itself. And I guess I think most of the community has come out saying that El Nino favors polar vortex disruptions and La Nina favors, let's say, a stronger polar vortex. But I mean, my own analysis has not really shown um, much of a relationship there between ENSO and the, you know, the strength of the polar vortex. Um, you know, we had the past went two winters 
exceptional polar vortex disruption. Well, you know, the first one was La Nina, second one was El Nino. I know two, two is a very small sample size, <laughs> but um, I, I, you know, it's not clear to me that there's a very strong relationship, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably a minority opinion on this and uh, most of the community does you know, the, 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 the conventional wisdom is there. El Nino favors disruptions of the polar vortex and La Nina favors a stronger vortex. I actually think it should be the other way around. And I think the reason why, one reason why you don't see plain relationship between El Nino and polar vortex, it could be because what's important is actually convection, convection that drives the wave, not SSD itself. So during, even during some El Nino years, um, the convection doesn't occur where, um, you know, usual uh, canonical El, uh, the convection occurs during canonical um, El Nino. So some uh, El Nino uh, years, convection actually occurs in the Central Pacific rather than Eastern Pacific. So they could actually, uh, you know, uh, Sort of uh, causes kind of some confusion, but yeah, yeah, it's not my own work. But I must, you know, think. I mean, I've had discussions with Amy Butler, who's worked with um, you know, Polvani, um, Lorenzo Polvani, you know, on this. I mean, you know, and they were first saying they, were, you know, they were equally between the, but I, th but they've, I know her. She's come around. I think the people she works with, that El Nino favors more polar vortex disruptions. Uh, but again, I, I think that, you know, the, the data is, is, the signal is not strong there. 